Okay, four o'clock. Okay, now we should start now. Okay. Um, so we don't have that many viewers right now. Hopefully, more people join. Um, okay, I'm Akiva Weisinger, and uh, this is the first uh, video cheer that I'm going to be giving. Um, you know, trying to figure out exactly how I want to do this, but um, let's figure it out as we go along. Um, and let's see what kind of things we can do on this format. Okay. Um, so for all two of you that are currently viewing this, and um, hopefully more people come, basically the subject that we're going to be dealing with is the book American Gods and an interesting Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky on Chumash, which seems to go along with that basic premise. Uh, go seems to uh, work with the basic premise of American Gods. And um, American Gods has recently become a TV show on stars. Um, as somebody in some kind of romantic capacity, I cannot recommend it to, I cannot recommend it to anyone who um, is God-fearing and stuff, um, but I've already started watching it, so whatever. Um, yeah, like, fair warning at the beginning of this, um, I do not claim to endorse the content of American Gods, either the book or the TV show in a rabbinic capacity. Um, I read the book because I'm a theology nerd, and I enjoy well-done, uh, books. Uh, I enjoy fantasy universes that make interesting kind of, uh, you know, structures on top of already existing mythologies, and it seemed like a promising book. Uh, there's a lot of sexual content in there, and there's definitely a lot of sexual and violent content in the show. Um, so, you know, I do a lot of shirim or classes on movies that I cannot necessarily religiously endorse, but I'm assuming that if you're watching this, you've already wa read the book or watched the show, and, you know, I'm just going to you know, related to Torah. Um, just a content warning in the beginning. Um, that's first of all. Second of all, um, let's get to the basic premise of American Gods and the important salient points that I want to get into um, that relate to the Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky at hand. Basic premise of American Gods is that there are, um, the, the gods of mythology exist, first of all, which... I guess is religiously problematic from a Jewish perspective. We'll get into that a little bit. And not only do they exist, they're sustained by worship or sacrifice. That when you worship, you know, a god or sacrifice to a god or spill blood to a god, um, either, you know, sacrifice or, you know, the case or a war dedicated to that god, um, that is the sustenance that allows gods to live. They they sustain themselves through worship and sacrifice, and uh, the premise is that when uh, immigrants came to America, they brought their gods with them. In other words, when they came on the shores of America, uh, they you know said thank you to their god, or they sacrificed to their god, or or immediately uh, thrust into you know uh, th thrust into war on behalf of their god, and that sustained, you know, that creates the gods on the American soil. And those are the old gods. The gods that are brought by the immigrant cultures are the old gods in this, you know, scheme in, uh, put forth by Neil Gaiman. Um, the problem is that, you know, as society has progressed and as, um, you know, people have melted into the melting pot, so to speak, uh, less people worship the old gods, and uh, they are a dying breed, so to speak. And then you have these new gods. The new gods are gods of technology or media or internet that are, you know, sustaining themselves through the worship and sacrifice 
of you know technologically driven societies of you know pre uh, post industrial post enlightenment societies as opposed to the pre industrial and pre enlightenment societies that the old gods represent and the background to the story of american gods is that there is a war brewing between the new gods and the old gods the old gods representing the pre industrial pre enlightenment societies and you know those dying out ideas and dying out cultures um, that are, you know, being s rough, uh, being like walked over by the changing world and the changing, the gods of the changing world, the gods of technology and media and internet that are, you know, saying that they're the new, they're, they're the, you know, the new gods and they're going to replace the old gods. Um, as a book, it's it's an incredible book. Uh, Neil Gaiman's an incredible writer, and like uh, one of the things that's most impressive about it is that he manages to uh, each like there are interludes where he describes like each god coming to America, and uh, he manages to like mimic the writing style that those you know the epics of the, the the stories about those gods or mythologies are written in. It's very impressive that he manages to do that. Um, and it's, what's interesting is it is, it's a coherent scheme that it's like a fantasy, uh, novel that has a coherent, you know, scheme of magic behind it. That makes a lot of sense. Um, you don't see that often. Like Harry Potter is not that at all. Like there's no, there's no mechanics of the magic there. There's just the strength of the Harry Potter book, and I don't want to get too far afield, the strength of the Harry Potter book is basically that it takes the magic for granted and then says, okay, but how would that society work? And what social problems would it have? And it does a pretty good job at that. But one of the things that's most impressive about American Gods is he really put some thought into like how this scheme would work. Um, so that's the basic premise of the basic premise of American Gods, to recap, is that there gods exist, that there are supernatural beings gods that exist and they're sustained by worship sacrifice and belief um and you know their their existence is dependent on people believing in them and worshiping them and sacrificing them we think that like uh gods exist before the people believe in them um that you know the question of whether to believe in god is basically is there a god out there or not and gaiman very cleverly switches it and says no they exist by virtue of the fact that people believe in them. Um, and uh, so that's a, uh, that's one component, uh, that gods are sustained by belief, worship, and sacrifice. Um, and this clash, which is very, there's a lot to it, uh, there's a lot to it as a, you know, understanding of American culture, of this clash between the old gods and the new gods, of, you know, each culture having its old god, and you know, set, and the fact that they owe their early success to you know the old gods, and um, the fact that in this you know melting pot of you know and the industrial age, those old gods are getting you know uh, ru you know run roughshod over by the new gods of technology and media, internet, and you know. Uh, industry stuff like that. Um, the main so the main components I want to bring to you are the existence of supernatural phenomenon being a function of belief and or sacrifice. That Gaiman's clever switch of the cl clever switch of the usual paradigm where it's they exist as a function of belief rather than you believe as a function of they existing, and this idea of the conflict between a pre-industrial pre-enlightenment society and their gods and you know post enlightenment post and uh, post enlightenment post industrial society um, and the gods that they create and how those are two very different things with two very different you know religious ideals um, so we've come to so that's what I want you to get out of American uh, that's what I want to focus on in American gods we're not going to go through the story which story happens in the foreground to this background um, 
and we're not gonna spoil the the end, gonna spoil any of it for you. It's not gonna be like uh, in depth analysis. I just want to work with this premise, the premise of American <laughs> Gods. It's very interesting theologically. Um, so now we come to this comment of Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky on Chumash. Um, I have put a link to the uh, put a link to a Google Drive um, file containing the uh, containing a PDF of the comment in question. Um, hopefully, you're you're able to see that. If not, um, I'm going to do screen capture in order to show you, to read it along with you. Um, some background to Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky. Um, Rav Yaakov is fascinating, and there's criminally little academic attention paid to him. Um, he was, you know, a very big Haredi Gadol. He was at one point head of the Moetzes, uh, uh, head of the Moetzes. Um, you know, he's, Claridi bona fides, and you know, Rosh Yeshiva of Yeshiva Torah Vidas um, came from the Slobodka Yeshiva. You you can rely on you know Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky. Um, the interesting thing about it is when you read his commentary in Chumash, it does not read like the commentary of a nice Litvish Yeshiva Bacher. Uh, it really does not. It. He's very interested in grammar. He's very interested in understanding realia. Uh, I hope I pronounced that correctly. It's just a kind of word that people don't say in normal conversation. Um, he's very into, uh, you know, he didn't really seem to have the tools of archaeology, or if he did, he didn't tell anybody that he did. But, like, you know, seeing it through that lens a little bit, seeing it through, he's very interested in geography. Uh, I wrote a paper once about how uh, he seems to use a Freudian idea in his under in his understanding of a couple of uh, places in Tanakh, a couple of places in Chumash, um, and we do have some evidence that he was a lot more interesting than he let on um, in the art scroll biography of him, uh, written by I believe his grandson. Um, that says that Rav Yaakov said that his Yetzirah was that he liked to analyze port, uh, areas of Torah that nobody else did. Um, and this seems like, you know, sort of, oh, that's your Yetzirah? Okay, fine. Um, but the biography points out that the altar of Sobodka actually took steps to rein him in to make sure that he didn't, uh, make sure that he stayed on the straight and narrow. And a lot of the stuff that Rav Yaakov was interested in is stuff that is classically part of uh, mus uh, part of part of the Muskilisha uh, Muskilim war. The um, you know enlightened thinkers. That's what it means. Um, the enlightened that they're very close to what we now call modern Orthodox, but you know they're became heretics and we don't like to talk about it that much, but basically they were very interested in grammar and like understanding Chumash Pshat, uh, Chumash Pshat. And um, Rav Yaakov's commentary is very similar to those. Uh, and, uh, my Rosh Hashiva uh, from Israel says, what makes Rav Yaakov fun, and he's the one who introduced me to Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky and Chumash, what makes Rav Yaakov fun is that he's a closet masculine. And that may not be inaccurate. So... Rav Yaakov is a whole source of fun, that's basically what I'm saying, and he does things that good literature Yeshiva Bakram don't do. Um, that's an introduction to Rav Yaakov. So, and um, one of the sheer series I'm considering doing is uh, a series called uh, Comments of Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky that won't make it into the R-Scroll edition, because there's a bunch of those. Anyway, um, now we come to the Rav Yaakov on, uh, the Rav Yaakov in question. Now, this is in Parshas Ve'era, where um, the plagues are, the ten plagues are about to happen, and are are happening, and you have the uh, case of the Khartoumim, the Egyptian magicians, who managed to replicate the early plagues until the Mak of Kinim, the uh, plague of lice, at which point they are no longer able to replicate the plagues uh, that Moshe has brought on. Uh, Eretz Mitzrayim. Um, so th the fact that the 
Egyptian magicians were able to replicate plagues such as, uh, you know, turning the Egyptian uh, Nile into blood and, you know, frogs coming ever coming out from everywhere. You know, it raises a little bit of an issue because we don't believe in magic anymore. Um, also, we tend to believe that there is a, our God is the God doing all this plague stuff. And, you know, he didn't necessarily want, uh, you know, we don't necessarily have like, you know, how to do magic stuff, but it seems in this, uh, it seems in this particular story that the idea of magic having some power is assumed to be correct. That the, and you know, there are theories that say that the, um, I'm getting too far afield. Like the, the fact that the magicians were able to replicate the two early plagues seems to be giving uh, giving legitimacy to the idea that magic could accomplish some things. Um, and this is not the only place where that seems to be the implication. There are various places. The, for, first of all, from the fact that the Torah tells you that you can't do magic, you can't do you know oven you don't eat. So it opens a question whether that means don't do this stupid thing that doesn't work. Or it's don't do this thing that uh, you know has power to it and is magical, and but we don't. God doesn't want you to do that, and that's uh, you know Machlokas for shown him. Um, you know the Rambam's very very much you know don't do it because it's a stupid thing. To, it's a stupid thing to do because it doesn't work. But there are other Rishonim like you know the Ramban and the Rashba uh, who would claim that no, these are real things. Uh, there's a very interesting comment. Uh, there's a very interesting comment by the Ramban where he says, "You know, I went to go observe a necromancer in order to understand whether there is magic or not." Um, and some people will use that as proof that the Ramban was some sort of crazy irrationalist who, you know, um, they'll use that to attack the Ramban. And some people hate the Ramban, and I don't quite understand why. The Ramban probably the smartest Rishon, um, but. You know, there are things that the Ramban believed that were irrational, but this was merely an instance where the Rosh, uh, the, where the Ramban was like, okay, if I need to, if I'm going to deny the existence of magic, I need to, you know, observe both sides of the issue. And he went and observed the necromancer. He's like, okay, it's a real thing. And then he wrote, okay, fine, magic's a real thing. Okay. Uh, that's more the Ramban being an empiricist than being an irrationalist. Anyway, that's a little far afield. But um, what there are very we're not just talking about miracles we're talking about like uh various instances of like magical things going on in Chumash um that raise a question of you know if there is magic if, if there is magic then you know what's going on here and also why doesn't the why don't those magic things exist anymore why can't why doesn't anybody seem to have those power those that power anymore um, there's also the fact of demons that are, uh, listed, that are talked about in, in Chazal. Um, we don't know, we haven't seen any demons, I think. Um, you know, I don't know what the audience of this particular video is, but you know, I, I haven't seen any demons. Uh, so the question is, the question that Rav Yaakov is going to begin with, and he's using this uh, sec the first time we really see magic is here, and he's, this is the first, is, he's using this as a jumping off point to discuss something of interest to him, is, okay, but, you know, if magic exists, why don't we see it anymore? And what is this magic thing that we're talking about? Okay, so um, if you can get the, if you have the, Emma Slyakov, uh, that I put on the chat in the video, then, you know, open that up. Uh, if not, I'll just do screen capture. Let's see. Screen share. Uh, hold on. Cool thing about screen share is that uh, when you have it on the actual video, then it just goes, it like breaks your brain. Okay. Anyway, so let's see where Vyakov inside. Uh, the magicians of Mitzrayim did the same with their staffs uh, and so on. 
Uh, on the matter of the question, why in our time has have has witchcraft stopped? And we don't see any witches anymore, um, unless you live in like Portland. Um, but even though they're, they're not like able to cast hexes, as far as I know. Gam uh, hashedim ne'alamu. Um, also, we don't see demons. Dibuk is, you know, a uh, term for like a uh, disembodied soul that uh, goes into your soul and then, you know, says crazy things and stuff like that. Um, you know, we don't see those anymore. And all these uh, types of hidden wisdom of, you know, he's talking like magic, like black magic. Heichonheim, where are they? Like, we don't see those anymore. Nearly, it appears to me, uh, It seems to me that um, God set up a system of this opposed to this. This is a phrase from, uh, I think, Mishle, and uh, a big idea in the thought of Rav Tzadok HaKohen Milublin. Um, this actually, this idea that Rav Yaakov is saying is actually very Rav like I don't know whether Rav Yaakov read Rav Tzadok or whether he just came up with this idea concurrently, which does happen. Rav Tzadok and Rav Kook are very similar. Rav, uh, Rav Tzadok and Rav Kook have very similar systems of thought, um, but don't seem to have read each other, which is interesting because one of the ideas that they both share is that certain ideas come from a zeitgeist regardless of like whether people are influenced by each other. So I like to say that Rav Kook and Rav Tzadok are evidence of their own ideas. Anyway, um, so Zelum, uh, nearly the Emesh Hesider Lano Hashem Yisrael Shiyeh Zelum and said that this is opposed to this. We'll get into what that means. Sheilu lo hayakin haysa habachira netula meis balei sechel. Because if not, if it were not for for this idea of Zelum and Zeh, then people would not have free will. We'll get into let's let's get into a little bit more. I'll explain. Okay. Um, let me see. It is true that when uh, when a person's will gathers uh, like. Uh, is what drives a person. He doesn't see even uh, even matters that are rational. When you want to do something, when you have a will to do something, you don't necess- you're not necessarily guided by rationality. That's basically what he's saying. Val Bechulza, and he's saying, even though that is the case, that when you want to do something, you reject a ra- you don't make rational decisions. Aval Bechulza's mucharku limso ezomakom lutos. Um, even in those cases, you find a way to rationalize what you're doing. Um, you know, you have to have basically. I don't know if he's going to say this explicitly because I didn't like fully prepare this. Whatever. What he's basically saying is that in order for free will to to exist, there needs to be doubt sowed by an opposing force. And in the case, and well. It'll become clear as we go on. Okay. As the Ramban writes further on, So he brings a proof from the Ramban. He brings uh, the example of the Ramban, who says that there, when there, when Kriyas Yamsuf happens, Pasuk makes pains to point out that uh, there was a strong wind uh, blowing that blowing the night before, and the Ramban says that the purpose of that was to give power a way out rationally, so that the miracle 
of the Yamsuf splitting would not necessarily would not he would have a way out of absolutely being forced to conclude that there is a that you know God is real and you know the Israelite God is real and so on and so forth. That um so this is where he gets explicit, okay? When there were prophets and when there were prophets who would give uh, signs and wonders that would support that to uh, uphold the word of Hashem. Um, this is very, let me, let me translate. If in a time where there were prophets who would prove that what they were saying by use of a miracle, like trust the way that the Rambam describes how a prophet was proven was that, you know, you would say, I'm a prophet, this miracle is going to happen, you know, miracle happens, that would confirm that he's a prophet. So if, you're ha if you have a situation where there's all these Nevi'im who have all proven themselves that they are prophets through the use of miracles, in order for free will to exist, there needs to be a force that is also capable of performing miracles in the same way that does not necessarily bring one to the conclusion that, you know, God is real, Judaism is true, all those good things. Um, thus, witchcraft exists, according to Rav Yaakov. Rav, Rav Yaakov is basically saying that witchcraft exists as a thing that allows people free will. Okay? Um, let's go back to what he was saying over here. Um, the Afsha... Uh, like uh, going back to the example of Paro, even in the case of Paro, where the uh, uh, the magicians of Egypt said after the Mak of Kinem, after the plague of lice, that oh, this is we can't beat this. This is you know uh, uh, the finger of God. Amar Paro believo Basically, uh, Rav Yaakov is saying that um, the Paro, even though he's answering an implicit question on his thing, which is actually on his idea, which is the magicians actually admit half, uh, after the Mak of Kingdom that they can't replicate what Moshe is doing, Power may just have thought, well, you know, Moshe is just a better magician than them. Um, so to recap what we're saying, Rav Yaakov believes that witchcraft exists as a function of having to allow people free will in a time period in which miracles exist. They're there to, you know, be a counteractive to the fact of miracles. Okay, let's go on a little bit. Therefore, all the all uh, every time, all time that there was prophecy, you could also uh, accomplish miracles through witchcraft. And very interestingly, Rav Yaakov knows that dem shedim, demons, are an idea that only exists in Chazal. And he says that there was a weaker level of prophecy and miracle working in the time of Chazal. Uh, he's going to come back to this later, actually. And in that time... It was a weaker level of, you know, opposing witchcraft, which were demons. Uh, and when there were people still able to do miracles, there were still, uh, in opposition to that, there were still demons whose power came from uh, the black uh black chariot i think that may be a term that he's using that i'm unfamiliar masha in came kisha kishahadlu bali mofes nasa hakol rak gashmios bilvad miata 
Rak hasichel v'harotzon nishpatim v'nevkim. This is where it gets pretty interesting. This is not the case that when um, when miracle workers ceased, it was because they existed in a you know uh, intellectual universe that only accepted uh, reason and rationality. And in those cases, once those once you know, society has progressed to the point where it only accepts reason and rationality, then witchcraft, then the main challenge to Jewish belief is no longer witchcraft. It's now, you know, uh, pure rationality, pure reason. And that takes the place of the oppositional force. Uh, Amarzel, Sifre Sofa Zosa Bracha, Sifre Sofa Zosa Bracha, the Book of Sifre Zosa Bracha, Lokam Yisrael Kamosha Od Aval Babav Liam Kam the Ezo Zeb Bilam Ben Beor. Famous Midrash that um, even though we say that there was nobody in, there will be nobody else like Moshe, there was one other person like Moshe who wasn't. Uh, uh, Israelite, and that was Bilam ben Beor. And you know, there's ideas that Bilam ben Beor and uh, Moshe were, uh, were, what's it called, were equals. And Rav Yaakov says it in the lines very nicely with my idea. In order for there to be free will to accept Moshe, there needs to be an oppositional force that me that makes that makes that a decision rather than, you know, something you're forced into by your seichel, okay? Ulfikach, Yosef HaTzadik, Kishamar lo paro, Kishamati alacha, Kishma chalon l'ftoro, so heshiv lo biladi, Kalomar ein zu me chachmasi, ela elokim ya ne'ez shalom paro. Chayin daniel, Amar lo nuchanetzer lo chachamin, Gomer yachlin lachvaya lamalka baram iti ila... Aramaic reading is not my strong is you know Ar- Daniel Safer Daniel reading is not um okay. Quotes a bunch of psukim. Del Chora Tikshu Tikshi Lama Lo Lahatil Chachme Bavel Hello Bilti Safek Sha Usama Chachamim Him Sha Achlu Kartsa Behudai the Sachnu as Hanana Michel Vazaria for Lama Lo Lahatilam. So uh he's asking in those cases where the um they're asked to like interpret dreams and stuff where you know biblical characters are, are asked to interpret dreams they always say that like it is not through my own power it's through god and why do they need to say that it was um, not so clear on this point particularly, but basically what he seems to be saying is that in those cases where they say we have to make a claim that um, they have to make a claim that uh, what's it called uh, where they have to make a uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. In those cases where they're, you know, asked to interpret a dreams and they uh, are told, you know, uh, the, uh, when they have to interpret a dream, they're very careful to point out that, like, we're coming from the godly side of the, you know, opposition and not from the, um, and, and not from the magic side. Okay, not so clear in that point. If anybody has any better explanations of that, feel free to let me know. Venira shilafiza nucha liyashev as dasa ramban hasover she inlashed him shuma achiza ben tzios vekulam shekerhein. So Rav Yaakov is tr- going to try to explain the Rambam who says that there are no shadim. Uh, Rambam says there are no shadim because Rambam is rationalist. Not much to explain, but Rav Yaakov is going to, you know, come up with an out-of-the-box way of explaining what's going on. Um, How could the Rambam come along and say that there are no Shadim when there are entire stories that are written about Shadim in the Gemara? What is the Rambam going to do with all these uh, with all these uh, stories? Um, does he claim that the rabbis just made this up? 
probably the Rama would claim something like these are allegorical, but that runs into trouble sometimes because there are stories about like you know uh, Yosef getting blinded by a demon, and uh, you know we do know that Yosef was blind, so either they believe that, or you know you could come up with some allegorical explanation, but. Ravyaka wants to know, like, what is the Ram going to do with all these stories of Shadim? Lefima Shekasafti. Avshar Shasilver Harambam, it's possible that the Ramam holds. Probably the Ramam probably does not hold this, but Ravyakov's answer is interesting nonetheless. Bivizman Hagamara, Shahayu Amaraim Shibakhulkham Haya Lahachios Mesim Lachol Niflaus Khudoma, that there were uh Amaraim who had the power to revive the dead and to uh, uh, conduct miracles? You know, the famous story about you know, uh, you know, Rabbi Ravzera on uh, Purim and Ravzera, you know, was revived. You know, there's some evidence to there's some you know Talmudic evidence that says that Amorim were able to perform miracles. So, in a time period where the Amorim were able to create miracles. Um, Shadim had to exist as a counterforce in order to make uh, belief in you know God and Judaism a freely made a freely made decision. Using that phrase that we noticed that he used before, zelu betokfo And if the uh, power of kedusha is that's uh, established. The koach, uh, the power of you know tuma is also also has to be established. And only and in our times that the spiritual powers are hidden and uh, melted away. Does he say any uh, more? Okay, he just says, this is something which goes back to American gods. Times that we don't have those same spiritual abilities anymore, The and there is no need for that oppositional force to exist it no longer exists. There are no shadim because we don't have that same kind of, you know, belief, we don't have that same kind of spiritual abilities. Then he finishes off. And I remembered that when I was in Kelm, I saw that Rav Elchanan Wasserman wrote in the name of the Chavetz Chaim, Shemasa Hadibu Kamaforsam Shahayu Biyamav. Um, that the dibuk that uh, the dibuk of the Chavetz Chaim, which is a well-known story, and it is a well-known story, um, was would be the last one, according to Rav Chanan Wasserman said in the Rav Chanan Wasserman said in the name of the Chavetz Chaim that this is the last dibuk. Kechol shetikaten koach haTorah ve'aruchnias, because. In accordance with the minimization of the power of Torah and spirituality, Cain tikaten koachatuma. In such a proportion, the power of uh, tuma also is minimized. Uh, Adkan. Uh, that basically means end quote. I don't know what that particular Rashi Tevos means. Whatever. And it is possible, in in reality, it is possible that even in our days, in places that uh, there remains Jews that are um, that are chadurim uh, that are unique in their that are sheltered in their faith and you know perfect in their actions that in those communities in those situations there will also be uh added power to because uh this opposed to this uh, uh is what god made okay so let's let me get back to seeing my 
seeing myself. Hold on. Where is it? Uh, okay. So basically, what Rav Yaakov, I'm going to sum up what Rav Yaakov said now that we've seen the text inside. Rav Yaakov is saying that the existence of supernatural forces is dependent on the advancement, and especially in that last comment, but, you know, summing up basically what we have. The existence of supernatural forces is existent, is dependent on the the level of advancement of that society. In We like to think that because, you know, the way that, and the way that we typically think, the way that, you know, seems the most accurate way of thinking. But I'm not saying that, you know, this Rav Yaakov is right, though I'll argue a little bit at the end that I think there's something to it. But the way they typically think about it is that there were never demons. They were never any supernatural things. Uh, and we got smart over time and figured out that there was no supernatural things. And, you know, now no longer exists. Now, you know, we know that it never existed. Rav Yaakov is sort of, you know, doing judo to that. He's taking that, you know, claim and then, you know, sort of using it to his own, uh, taking the power of that claim and then, you know, sort of taking it to his own, to its own end, to his own ends. He's saying, no, it's not that we got smarter and realized that there were no supernatural forces. It's that when we become smarter, and when we become a more rational based society, those supernatural forces begin to cease to exist because they are no longer the challenge that is needed for the people of that time. In other words, when we, when, you know, the Jewish people are in a time of miracles and prophets and when they have, you know, signs and miracles happening constantly, then in order to make faith a freely made decision, there needs to be forces that oppose that, that are coming from the same, that are, you know, of a similar, uh, there needs to be a challenge to faith that is coming from a similar perspective. So if there are miracles going on, then there need to be miracles going on from like an anti-faith direction in order to make faith a freely made decision. Once modernity happens and once our society sort of rejects the, you know, supernatural, sort of rejects the supernatural, then, you know, even if we were to see it, even if we were to see it, that would not be the main challenge to our faith. Like nobody is challenged these days by, uh, nobody's faith is challenged these days by the existence of magic. Our faith is challenged these days by the existence, by, you know, rational, by rational arguments, you know, historical and all the, you know, all the things that come with, and, you know, physicality and, you know, uh, industry, stuff like that. Those are the things that challenge our faith. And then in such a, in such a case, the supernatural demons and magic stuff ceases to exist because that's no longer what is needed. Um, so to bring it back to American gods, basically Rav Yaakov is claiming that there are supernatural entities that exist solely as a function of the belief systems of the societies in which they're based. That there are demons and you know magic and witchcraft and stuff that exist as a function of the fact that they need to be there to provide, you know, free will to the people, to provide a opposition to make uh, faith a freely made decision. That's first of all. So that's an interesting parallel to American gods. Second of all, this idea of pre-industrial society having one set of, you know, faith challenges and those being almost completely overrun by the challenges of a new era and, you know, the old gods of, you know, the Jewish religion, Lahavdil, Elifavdelos, having to deal not with, you know, the other old gods, but having to deal with the new gods of, you know, technology and uh, science and all those things uh, is something that very much comes out of this, you know, piece of Rav Yaakov. 
And what's fascinating about this piece of Rav Yaakov is, uh, again, you know, I talked before about Rav Yaakov not, uh, like Rav Yaakov's commentary not being the work of a nice Litvashi Yeshiva Bacher. Um, you know, typically when I say that, I mean like it's more maskilish than you'd usually expect. But in this case, it's more that this is more of a Hasidish idea or, you know, an uh, idea that you would come to with Hasidus this is more like a Rav Cook or a, uh, this is more a Rav Cook or a Tzadok or, you know, maybe even like Nachman Krachmal, maybe. Um, but like, this is not, you know, the typical kind of, you know, broad Hashkafa that, you know, histor historiographical Hashkafa that you typically get, uh, which makes Rav Yaakov fascinating. But anyway, like, there's, so, Basically, we have the idea down, I think. If people don't have the idea down, you know, they could, you know, let me know. Which is that the reason why we don't have demons anymore is because they're no longer the challenge of faith that is necessary. Um, you know, we don't have demons and magic anymore because, like, uh, we have a different type of religiosity that requires a different type of, a different type of challenge. Um, so, you know, spend, like, a minute or two or, you know, knowing myself, like, 10, kind of long-winded, I know, talking about, like, does this idea have any merit? Is this idea useful? Because it seems, you could go and say, with a lot of justification, that, okay, this idea is very clever, but it's, you know, it's basically, it's like... It's very, it's a very clever, but, you know, fundamentally wrong idea that, you know, you're basically saying, you're taking the same evidence that like we in the scientific era don't believe in demons anymore and that we don't find any demons anymore. And instead of explaining it as like, there never were any demons, you go, oh, that's because they magically stopped existing. They magically stopped existing once we, you know, started having different religion. And there's actually a similar idea, which is quoted in the name of the Kotzker, that somebody asked him, like, you know, the Rambam said that there were demons, and the Vilna Gaon said that there weren't any demons. Uh, who's right? And the Kotzker is supposed to have remarked, well, when the Rambam said that, uh, when the Rambam said that there weren't any demons, uh, the demons ceased to exist, and then the Vilna Gaon, you know, when he said that there were demons, uh, they poof, they went back into existence. Um, which, thanks, Volnagon, whatever. Um, I don't think that the Kutzker actually meant this seriously. It sort of cuts against most of his other philosophical statements, and I think he was being sarcastic. But, like, let's, let's use that quote as an example of something that's, you know, ridiculous, of, like... You know, you're getting around the problem by saying it, saying that, oh, you know, they just poof magically, ex they poof used to exist, and now they don't, they don't exist anymore. So, you know, from a perspective of like, you know, pure evidential, uh, you know, empirical scientific things, yeah, I think that's, you know, a good point. You don't necessarily have to take that Rav Yaakov seriously. But let's have a little fun. Okay. The idea that, you know, miracles are impossible, you know, uh, that just because no miracles happen now, therefore miracles cannot have happened ever, never seemed, you know, airtight to me. Because, you know, the whole point of a miracle is that God did something. The whole, you know, definition of a miracle is that God did something which went against nature. So, the fact that nature doesn't work that way, and we, you know, have investigated and found that nature doesn't work that way, is no evidence that miracles are impossible. It just means that we know how nature works. The real question is, if miracles happened, why don't they happen anymore? That is a better question. Okay, to re to 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 you know restate that point. Claiming that because miracles happen nowadays, they can't have happened ever is not a good point. Asking why they don't happen nowadays when they are supposed to have happened yes, uh, you know, in former days is a better question, in my opinion. And what Rav Yaakov has done here is given us a way of answering that question. That 
there are certain things, there are certain sort of, you know, divine phenomenon that are necessary for certain ages that are not necessary for other ages. And I think you could work with this to understand, to give you, give yourself an understanding of how miracles are supposed to have happened in biblical times and don't happen anymore. That, you know, I almost, you know, wrote an article on this and uh, as happens with most of my articles, I, you know, overthought it and never ended up writing it. But the idea that um, God felt it necessary to perform miracles to break, to prove to the Israelites that nature is not, th that, you know, there is a transcendent God who transcends nature and that actions and that, you know, people in this world can transcend, you know, their nature and their, the power structures that they find themselves in and, you know, breaking them, uh, bringing them out of Egypt and, you know, splitting the sea. That could have been meant for a very specific time period where there wasn't, you know, a real sense that, you know, na nature is not destiny. And now that we, basically what I was trying to write in this paper is that now that we have tech, now that we have technology, now that we know very clearly that like we are capable of doing things that transcend the natural uh, state that we find ourselves in, miracles are not, don't, Miracles are not there because they never existed, but because they aren't necessary anymore to teach us something. Their their job was done. You know, like you can come up with a better answer than me as to why miracles were necessary then and necessary now. In fact, like I came up with this reasoning like, you know, five years ago. I'm already seeing problems with it as I'm talking about it. But like basically I think that what makes this piece useful and not just, you know, a nice little out of the box thing that Riviaco comes up with is that it gives us a direct and understanding how supernatural events could have happened in biblical time periods and not happen now and not. So, um, you know, hopefully this was a good, uh, interesting time. Uh, I don't know if anybody stuck with me all the way through. Um, it doesn't appear, give me the option to see like who's watching and like how many people, and I've fluctuated from like six to 10 watchers this entire time. I don't know. We'll see. Um, basically what I want to do is to have like a series of video sharing on various topics and, uh, fund that and, you know, have them funded through Patreon. Uh, I could post the link. Um, but this is a trial run to see how many people could, you know, would be interested in this sort of thing. And, uh, you know, hopefully I taught you something interesting. Um, okay. Let's, uh, I'm going to stop now. And, uh, any feedback that you can give me is, uh, you know, appreciated. And, uh, let me know what you thought. All right. Have a good night.